randomized experiment is the gold standard in empirical research. However, experiments are not always feasible due to, for example, cost or ethics reason. And for that reason, it is also important to understand that there are other designs that kind of like mimic experiments that we could apply when a true randomized experiment is non-feasible. In these, these techniques or these designs fall into pre-experimental designs and quasi-experimental designs which are sometimes referred to as natural experiments as well. Let's take a look at what these designs are. So the idea of true experiment is that we have uh, these five characteristics. First we have a random assignment. So uh, we randomize people into at least two groups. So we have uh, the treatment group and then we have the control group. Then we manipulate the, the main independent variable whether one group gets the treatment, other one doesn't or some other manipulation. We measure the outcome from both groups and we compare the difference. And fifth importantly, there must be experimental control in the sense that these groups, they undergo the same procedures except for the treatment. So for example, in medical trials, we have the medication pill and then we have a placebo pill for the control group so that both groups actually go the exact same procedure but only one of the groups get the actual medication in their bodies. And uh, importantly, experiments do not do need to be conducted in labs. So experiments can be done in the field. So you can go outside the laboratory, go to, uh, to uh, the lobby of the university, go to a real company, go to the city and do your experiment there. We can also do field trials and trial refers to uh, trying out something. For example, if we have schools, we could uh, get 100 schools to participate in a trial of an anti-bullying program and then half of those schools would implement the program, other half would be the, in the control and then we would compare the outcomes after the program is done or a, a, a some years later. So that's the field trial. Also we can do experiments in surveys. Survey items are often tested by doing this um, two different uh, forms, slightly different survey forms, and then we have our sample, we divide it into two randomly, and uh, then we check for small, if small differences in how we frame our questions cause differences in actual response. This kind of um, testing is also done quite often in, uh, on internet. So internet companies do this, what they call A-B testing. So people receive uh, two different user interfaces randomly and then the company checks if these two groups of people behave differently with the software. An important class of these uh, randomized surveys is the uh, experimental Vignette study. And uh, these studies present the informants a scenario and some characteristics of the scenario are varied and uh, then the two variations are randomly assigned to the informants and then we check if there's a difference. Again, the important part is not that we have lab, but the important part is that we have treatment and control, randomly, uh, random assignment and then experimental control so that the treatment and control groups only differ in the manipulation that they receive. Let's take a look at what other designs we have, but before that, or, or other designs. So uh, experiment is the gold standard, but we can we have designs that kind of mimic experiments. These are sometimes called pre-experimental designs and quasi-experimental designs. What exactly differentiates between quasi-experimental and pre-experimental design depends on which definition or which book you look at, because the, the difference is not so clear cut. According to uh, this tires definition, pre-experimental design is a study where there is uh, a treatment and observation of an outcome, but there is no control group. So we, we can we only can we compare either uh, the group that receives the treatment against itself from previous time point or don't do any comparisons. And uh, then uh, quasi-experimental design adds to that a control group, but it lacks randomization. And then uh, the true experimental design, of course, has the five features that I discussed on the previous slide. Let's take a look at different designs that uh, we can construct. 
And this is the gold standard, the experiment. We have the treatment and control, we have randomization. And this experimental design can be expressed with this uh, shorthand. So we have R, randomization, we have X, the treatment, then we have control, the group that doesn't receive the treatment, and then both groups are measured after the treatment. So this is a, a way of, of writing down an experimental design or quasi-experimental design in, in a short way. And I'll be using this notation on the next couple of slides. Let's take a look at what these pre-experimental designs are. And Singleton and Straits lists three, uh, three experimental designs. We have the one-shot case study. We do something X, we observe what happens O. For example, if I implement a new teaching strategy on my course and then I uh, measure the, the student satisfaction of the course afterwards, that would be uh, uh, a one-shot case study. And um, it's problematic because let's say that I receive uh, high ratings for my uh, new teaching approach. That doesn't really tell whether the approach worked or not. It's also possible that the group was, uh, the student group just happened to like the subject of my course and the outcome had nothing to do with the teaching strategy that I applied. Uh, a second slightly better strategy is one group pre-test, post-test. So let's say that um, we are doing a medical trial and we measure the health of the individuals before the treatment, then there is the treatment and we measure the health after the treatment and we compare the difference. But this is not a valid causal claim or valid causal effect because it is possible that there would have been a difference in any case. So it's when uh, people are sick, they get better spontaneously without any medication and also some uh, people that are not sick get sick during the treatment. So we need to have the, uh, the comparison. Uh, a third is static co group comparison. So the idea here is that we have a group that receives treatment, we have a group that doesn't, but it is not randomized. And even if we have a difference here after the treatment, the problem is that we don't know if that difference is due to the treatment or if it was a difference that existed even before we did anything for the two groups. Let's compare these against uh, experimental designs. So we can, uh, these are the, uh, the, the three experimental designs or three main variants of experimental design that Singleton and Straits present. And uh, we can easily see that the one shot case study can be converted to uh, a true experiment by adding randomization and a control group. So this is the post-test only design and this uh, one group pre-test post-test can be converted to a true experiment by adding randomization to treatment and control as well. So typically when go we go from pre-experimental to uh, experimental we add a randomization and we add a control group. Then there's the third design, the within subject design. These are rare in social sciences because uh, the idea here is that we have, for example, two treatments that we compare and e every individual receives both treatments. And uh, this assumes that the treatments, can, we can apply or administer the treatments so that one treatment does not interfere with the other one. And they are rare, so I don't address them anymore on this video. But that's, that's basically the, uh, the typical uh, experimental designs and any experimental design is, can be uh, expressed as a variant or extension of these. Now, what are quasi-experiments? So quasi-experiments are somewhere between the pre-experimental and the actual true experiment designs. So we may, may have a non-random assignment or we, we lack some of the O's and X's in, in those previous designs. Some of the designs that are uh, typically presented in text or, or quasi-experiments is the separate sample pre-test post-test design. The idea here is that we have randomization but we can, everyone receives the treatment at the same time but we can measure these and, and the contrary is everyone receives the treatment. So let's say that there's a, an important medication that, that people just must receive. So it would be unethical to, to not give it to them. 
and we can still test the effectiveness of the, of the medication by randomly measuring half of the people before the medication and half the, of the people after the medication. Let, let's assume that uh, we are here constrained that we can only measure each person once. So typically we apply quasi-experimental designs when uh, we are not allowed to or cannot afford to run a full experiment. Of course, it will be better if we measure the outcome for both groups before and after and even better, better if we leave this as a control, but we could not in this case. Then it's possible that we have a non-equivalent control group design. So the idea here is that we have pre and post measurement. We have treatment group X, we have control group non X, but we don't have randomization. So perhaps there is self-selection, perhaps somebody else selects our treatment group or our control group and uh, whether we can make a causal claim here depends on what kind of assumptions we're willing to make. And then we have interrupted time series design and this is sometimes classified as a pre-experimental design because it doesn't have a control group but here the idea is that we have a time series of repeated measures then we have something happens or something or we administer a, a treatment here and then we follow the time series again. The idea why this could be considered as a quasi-experimental design is that because of this time series nature here, we can uh, use the individual before the treatment as a counterfactual group for the individual after the treatment or the group after the treatment rather. So we can uh, estimate the trend here before, we can estimate the trend after and then we can um, Based on those two trends, we can infer what would have happened if X wouldn't be here. So that's uh, an important quasi-experimental design. These quasi-experiments are sometimes referred to as natural experiments. The idea of a natural experiment or what makes a quasi-experiment is, is a natural experiment is that there is, a, for example, a natural treatment. And uh, let's say that there is a, there's a company that happens to uh, implement a pay for performance program but it only does it for half the people for some reason and they are assigning it randomly. So someone is randomizing but it's not us. Or it could be that there is a um, new policy implemented here X and that policy is implemented uh, independently of, of what happened to the outcome variable. So the idea of natural experiments is that there, there's something that happens to either a time series or one group but not the other and the important part in natural experiments is that the x here whatever happens must be exogenous or at least it must be that we can make reasonable assumption that it is exogenous. So how do we then uh, analyze how do we find or how do we design quasi-experimental studies? Typically when you do a uh, your study, you start with a research question, then you do a research design, you design the, if you do experiment, you design the treatment condition, you design the control condition, and then you run the experiment. With natural experiments, this is uh, not about design as much as it is about discovery. So you, you, if you want to do a natural experiment, then the typical way is to, uh, to go and try to discover sources of natural variation in the X that you're interested in, that hopefully is exogenous or at least sufficiently so that we can use the natural um, or quasi-experimental techniques and the data analysis techniques that are used with these designs. This article by uh, Sivek and Santoni uh, recommends that a good way for discovering natural experiments is to look at natural experiments that have been published before. So perhaps there is uh, there are some scenarios that or or some phenomenon that happens to generate these kind of natural experiments, then you can go and, uh, and find an instance of that phenomenon and then study it yourself. But this is, these are difficult to find and perhaps that is one reason why they're not so common in management research. When you have discovered a potential natural experiment, you need to decide how you go about analyzing the data. And this paper also provides a nice flowchart and the first question that you need to ask when you have a potential natural experiment is, is the assignment to treatment random or as if random? So as if random means that uh, 
we can we can assume that it is so close to being random that it doesn't make a difference if it if it's not exactly random. <laughs> For example, if uh, people get to self-select into receiving medication or not receiving medication, and then we measure the outcome, is this assignment random or not? To answer that question, we need to consider three different things. First, do the people have information? So do they know that they have the option to go into these two treatments? Are they aware of their health, which is our dependent variable? And, and if so, if they have the information, they know their health, they know that they have two options. Then the, the second question is that, do they have incentives to use this information to have a preference to go into pretreatment group or control group? So for example, in, in the case of medication, we could uh, assume that if people know their health, they know that the medication probably works and they know that they have the option of not having the medication or having the medication, then perhaps those people who are more sick have more incentives to be in the treatment than those people who are less sick. And then the final thing, do they have capacity? So can people actually make a decision? So perhaps uh, you are uh, not taking your medication yourself, but someone else is giving to you, in which case you wouldn't have the capacity. If individuals have information, incentives and capacity, then uh, we can infer that the treatment probably is not as if random. If one of these is missing, then uh, the as if random assumption is probably more defensible. The second thing that we need to consider is, uh, do units change treatment status? So what that basically is about this is compliance and non-compliance. So if an individual chooses to go to the treatment condition and receive medication, do they actually take the medication? Or the other way, if a, a, an individual chooses to go to the control condition, is it possible that they somehow get access to the medication? So that, that's probably not as relevant as the first kind of non-compliance. If we have as if random, and if there is no non-compliance, then uh, we apply just normal analysis that we would apply for experimental design. So just normal regression analysis or t-test between two outcomes, depending on, on whether you want to add control variables or not. If there is non-compliance, then like in any other experiments, you must use instrumental variable design. So uh, we use the treatment as an instrument. This is our explanatory variable and then uh, we have uh, the outcome variable and we use instrumental variable estimation techniques. If the treatment here is, is not as if random, then we have another question that we need to ask. Is it possible that there, there's a, a variable that determines either deterministically or probabilistically whether an individual goes into the treatment or not. And if yes, then we can apply regression discontinuity design. If no, then we basically have a correlational design. But this is a very useful flowchart because it really simplifies the choices that you have to make and the article itself explains the reasoning and what kind of things you need to consider when you make these three different choices here. And of course, if we don't have this possibility for rigorous and discontinuity design, if we have an exogenous source of variation, like in observational studies, we can always use an instrumental variable design. So these quasi-experimental designs are very usable and they may have higher external validity than experiment while still having quite strong internal validity. Unfortunately, they are not very common in management research. One thing uh, that may explain this, that natural experiments are difficult to find, but this is certainly something that any researcher uh, who works in the field should consider.